is always really hard. But Marilyn's mother had actually been murdered just days earlier. So this was obviously a very unexpected death. Marilyn helped her father, her stepfather, make arrangements. Um, they held a funeral. They buried the remains. And then she made a call to the coroner's office because um, she was trying to get her mother's jewelry that she had been wearing at the time of her death back from them. So, um, she makes this call and, um, the, like, receptionist or whoever answered at the coroner's office said, um, you can get your mother's personal effects back once, um, the coroner has released the body, but because we still have the body, like, the autopsy is not complete. We can't release those yet. But Marilyn had already buried her mother, so she was super confused. She would later say about this experience, quote, I was thinking we just had the funeral. I saw the remains, and I was looking at something that wasn't my mother. As it would turn out, um, Marilyn's mother, Mary Morris, was in fact buried during the funeral they held for her. But the confusion came from the fact that there was another woman named Mary Morris, who had also been murdered just four days after Marilyn's mother, Mary Morris. And this second Mary Morris was in the process of having her autopsy completed. So, we have two women named Mary Morris, both murdered in Houston, Texas, just days apart. And this couldn't be a coincidence, or could it? Today, we will be talking about the Mary Morris murders. So, let's now go back and talk about Mary Lou Henderson Morris. Marilyn's mother. Mary Lou had married a man named Jim Henderson, and they had a little girl named Marilyn. This marriage didn't last. Um, she was single for a while, and then when Marilyn was um, grown, she met a man through um, like a want ad in the newspaper, like a personal ad. And his name was Jay Morris. So they got married. They had been married for five years at the time that Mary Lou was murdered. And they both seemed very happy. Marilyn worked as a loan officer at a Chase Bank in Houston. And, sorry, Mary Lou worked at a Chase Bank, and Marilyn would describe her mother as, quote, one of the nicest people that you would ever want to know. She acted like she was 20. She was always going somewhere. She was always doing something. And she never missed a day of work. She enjoyed gardening and riding horses as well. So just 
see his wife alive again. Jay watched as she like pulled out of the neighborhood and then turned left. Um, so he knew she was probably headed to the gas station. That was the way she went to work if she needed to grab gas first. So he assumes she's gonna like fill up her tank before heading into work. Jay went about his day as normal. Um, he tried to check in with Mary several times throughout the day, but he was never able to get a hold of her. Around 2 p.m., Jay got a call from the manager of the bank asking if Mary Lou was home, but when the manager called, he didn't say, hey, this is so-and-so from Jay's bank. He just asked for Mary, and when Jay said she's at work, he just said, okay. He didn't tell Jay, actually, no, she never showed up for work today, and I'm not sure if maybe he thought he was covering for Mary Lou. It's kind of strange, um, but he was concerned because she had worked there for so long and had never missed a day. She had never even called in sick. So the manager gets off the phone, and Jay has no idea that anything is amiss. He kind of assumed that Mary would call and check in that afternoon. I guess they normally would check in here or there with each other, but he didn't hear from her. He had been trying to get in touch with her on her cell phone. Later in the afternoon, he realized she was like kind of in such a rush to leave that she hadn't taken it with her and it was still like plugged in and charging at home. So he's like, no wonder she isn't calling me back. So he calls the bank and this is around 5 p.m. And he asks to speak with Mary. And this is when he is told that Mary never showed up to work that day. This is very alarming news to Jay. He was a very, she was a very dependable employee. She always went to work. She was like that person who went above and beyond and she had never called in sick once in the 15 years that she had been working at the bank. So Jay gets off the phone with the bank and immediately calls Marilyn. And he's like, I haven't heard from your mom, have you? She didn't show up to work. Marilyn also hasn't heard from her mother and is shocked because this is so completely out of character. So Jay and Marilyn immediately go to the police station and file a missing persons report. And once the missing persons report has been filed, Jay and Marilyn kind of take the investigation into their own hands. They got into Jay's car and decided to go searching for Mary, trying to retrace her steps for that day. I think their thought process was that she hadn't made it to work. She had forgotten her phone, so maybe she was stranded somewhere with, like, no way of reaching out. So they're driving around, and they hear on the radio that there was a report of a fire nearby the home. A car was reported on fire just miles from Jay and Mary's home. So they rush 
release any of that information. They just said, basically, you need to go home and just wait for more information. Like, we don't know anything yet. So, let's talk about this car fire for a minute because it had been blazing for hours. Around 10 o'clock that morning, someone called 911 and they told dispatchers there was smoke coming from this area, like this pretty remote area. I couldn't really find any information on the area itself, like if it was pretty common for people to burn like weeds or garbage or something in this area. But for whatever reason, like a report that there was a fire in the area wasn't alarming to the fire department. No one did anything. No firefighters were dispatched to the scene. Like, I guess they just took note of this report. And that was it. Then, later that evening, this guy was on his four-wheeler in the same area. And he made a call to 911. And he said that there was an abandoned car fully ignited and that the fire was spreading like all the weeds around it were, and like the brush and stuff were also on fire. So at this point, police and firefighters rush to the scene to investigate. It was later confirmed that this was, in fact, Mary Lou's car. And it wasn't was found in the passenger seat of the car. However, it took days to positively ID the remains or what was left of the remains. It was actually only through dental records that Mary Lou Henderson Morris was able to be identified. Police estimated that the fire had been blazing for at least seven hours by the time authorities arrived. Some of the jewelry that Mary had left the house wearing was discovered in her car near her remains. But interestingly, her wedding ring was missing. Her purse was also missing from the vehicle. And when I first heard this, I thought, okay, the motive was robbery. Her purse and her wedding ring were missing. She's found in the passenger seat, meaning she didn't probably drive herself out there. I was thinking maybe... She was carjacked at the gas station on her way to work and robbed. Um, so anyway, that made sense to me, but police right from the beginning did not believe robbery was a motive for the crime. Because the crime scene had essentially been on fire for hours police were not able to recover really anything as far as like forensic evidence. Mary's body was so badly burned that a medical examiner was never able to determine a cause of death. So, police began investigating right away. They're speaking with her family, neighbors, her co-workers, trying to find a motive for the murder. But everyone, everyone loved this woman. Not one person had a bad thing to say about her. She had to know 
she didn't even have people who didn't like her. She was just this very sweet, very kind person. She wasn't involved in anything illegal. She didn't have weird debts. She didn't hang out with questionable people. So police were pretty baffled by her murder. Arson, um, and it was determined to be arson. They found an accelerant they believe was gasoline poured on her body, like all over the inside of the car and even outside the car, like the surrounding area. So they have arson, um, a missing wedding ring, and absolutely no motive. Police said, quote, whoever did this took a great deal of time to seclude her out in that area. If you get someone out for drug money, he may kill her and try to wipe off the prints, but someone went to the trouble to make sure there was absolutely no evidence left. And um, I actually read that in order to get to the area where Mary's car was found, the killer would have had to driven down two different roads, stopped and got out of the car to open a gate that led to the Harris County Drainage District property, then drive about 600 feet through some really tall grass and brush, and then they parked the car in a pipeline ditch, which is where it was found later by police. So, police are busy investigating the murder of Mary Lou Morris, and while they are busy doing that, another murder is about to happen in Houston. Mary McGinnis Morris was killed the day before Mary Lou Henderson Morris was like laid to rest. Mary McGinnis Morris moved to Texas from West Virginia in 1998. She had gotten a job in Texas. She was actually a nurse practitioner. She got a job in Texas and this was the reason for the move. Um, she had been married to her husband, Mike Morris, for 17 years, and together they had a daughter named Katie. So when our case begins in 2000, Mary was 39 years old. Um, she was very involved in, like, community plays. She loved to act. She was described by her sister as someone who lived life to the fullest. She was very bubbly and outgoing. She had a lot of friends. Um, so as a nurse practitioner, she worked at several different clinics, seeing patients, and she was very well respected. So while there was a lot of good in Mary McGinnis's life, there were also some darker parts. While Mary was working, her husband hadn't been able to find a job since they had relocated years earlier. So, this put a lot of strain on their marriage and they often fought about finances. But this wasn't the only issue in their marriage. Mike believed that Mary was having 
having an affair. And right before she died, he actually confronted her about it. And um, he had like a certain man who he thought she was having an affair with. And he confronted the man as well. husband, Mike, would later say that he believed them when they said there was nothing between them. And he even said that when Mary died, they had really kind of gotten their marriage back on track, and they were back to being good friends. But this isn't actually how Mary's closest friends and even her sister would describe the marriage. In fact, Mary's sister said that Mary had confided in her that she was no longer in love with Mike. And her sister believed that she was pretty close to asking him for a divorce. Another part of Mary's life that was not great was this very strained relationship with a co-worker. Um, she began having problems with him months before she was killed. His name was Dwayne Young, and she had confided in several people, including an HR representative, that he made her very uncomfortable. She had filed several reports with HR, and disciplinary action had been taken against Duane. Um, and Duane was fired just two days before Mary was murdered. So one day, Mary goes to work, and she has all these picture frames on her desk, like pictures of her family. And someone has turned them all, like, facing the other way. And then they had written on her desk calendar, like her big calendar, that like a paper calendar that was on her desk, death to her. So Mary immediately thinks, this is Dwayne. And she goes to HR to report this. And they already had several, like, official reports against Duane by Mary, so they're like, look, we are gonna go ahead and fire him, um, but you probably shouldn't come into work tomorrow when we do it, because things may get ugly. And they did. Duane did not take the news well. He completely flipped out and had to be escorted from the building by security. And then he came back um, and he was like banging on the doors and windows, demanding to see Mary. Um, now he has since denied all of these accusations. Um, so just take that information as you will. But this all happened just days before Mary was murdered. This entire incident, like all of the problems leading up to Duane being fired, really shook Mary. She just started to feel unsafe, and she went to her husband at one point and said, I want you to teach me how to shoot a gun. So Mike began teaching her how to shoot. Um, he gave her a gun that was registered in his name and instructed her to keep it under the driver's seat of her car um, just for safety purposes. As it would turn out, this would be the gun that would end Mary's life. On October 15th, 2000, Mary's morning started off as normal. She 
ring. 
facts are missing. And these murders were just days apart. When police found out that Mary McGinnis's uh, marriage was on the rocks, Mike Morris became their first person of interest. However, he had an alibi. He had actually been at a movie with his daughter Katie when his wife was attacked. He told police that he had called Katie, um, sorry, he had called Mary, his wife, around 7 p.m. the night she was killed, but she didn't answer. Now, he didn't really cooperate with the investigation. He gave police a DNA sample, but he refused a polygraph, and he refused to allow police to speak with Katie, his daughter, who was still a minor at the time. And he also lawyered up very quickly. So police looked into his alibi with like a fine tooth comb and they looked into his phone records wanting to make sure his pings lined up with his story just verifying the alibi. But wow. But while they were looking at the phone records um, they noticed something. They saw the call that Mike had made to Mary that night, it came in at 7.11 p.m. But Mike's version was that Mary hadn't answered, and that didn't line up with the evidence because according to police, the call had connected, meaning it had been answered. And not only that, it lasted for over four minutes. But here's where it gets, like, really strange. Mary was already dead by 7-11, so who had answered her phone and who had Mike spoken with for over four minutes? He, um, basically maintained that nobody ever answered the call and he tried to explain it away by saying there must have been some kind of a glitch or something like that because he never spoke to anyone on the other end that night. So the Mary Morris murders became huge news in Houston, really big news in Texas, and the people could not stop talking about it. They couldn't stop speculating about it. They couldn't stop pointing fingers. A lot of people had a theory that a hitman had been hired to kill Mary McGinnis Morris. So this theory went that, I guess, if you hire a hitman to kill your wife, he will bring your wedding ring or her wedding ring back as proof that she's dead. So, this is why people think a hitman was involved. The theory was that the wrong Mary Morris was killed first. Um, the intended target was not Mary Lou, but Mary McGinnis. So then the hitman had to go back just days later and kill the intended hit, Mary McGinnis Morris. The two Marys looked pretty similar. Um, they were close-ish in age. And while they didn't drive the same car, the models of their cars were quite similar. 
asking. 
someone was hired to kill Mary McGinnis. And I think that person was maybe not like a hitman because obviously they were not good at it. But I think they killed the wrong Mary Lou. I think they got her out to this abandoned area. Went to get the gun from under her car, from under her seat. And there wasn't one, so they had to improvise and start a fire. Now, if that is the case, and also that would explain why her red wedding ring was gone, like the person took the wedding ring to give to the husband, and the husband was like, this isn't my wife's wedding ring. So he had to go back and kill the other Mary Morris. Um... In my opinion, it makes more sense that Mike, the husband, had her killed. He would have known about the gun. He had a motive. She was cheating on him. And if he got wind that she was planning on leaving him or asking him for a divorce, he may have panicked. He had no income. And she had a life insurance policy. One of the things that makes me think he is guilty is the fact that when he found his wife's wedding ring, he didn't tell police. Like, that just seems sketchy to me. Why not say, oh, hey, by the way, we found this and we know you have a lot riding on the wedding ring thing. You know what I mean? To keep that quiet just seems like he's hiding more than just that information. Um, could it have been her co-worker, Dwayne? Absolutely. Um, the fact that she had a bad feeling about a man who she recognized as someone she had met through Dwayne makes me think absolutely it could have been him. He maybe had, like, a friend who he hired to kill her. Um, the fact, like, her whole 911 tape, the way they have described it, we know this woman had a brutal death, and it just makes me so sad that, that it was captured on tape, but luckily her family will never hear it, but, um, that does kind of make me lean more toward the co-worker. I don't really know. I don't have a solid theory in this case. You guys let me know what you think. I'd love to hear your theories in the comments. Remember to head over to Instagram and follow me. My account's private, but I will let you in. And yeah, have a great Tuesday, you guys. Love you.